my husband became a werewolf. This story was told by a young woman named Maria. I will continue the story in her name. How does one become a werewolf? It's not difficult if the desire is strong enough. My husband became a werewolf. But is this the life we wanted? Now I understand. All things secretive and inexplicable should be left where they are born. Interfering with the course of fate is fraught with consequences. For a whole year after our wedding, Slava and I were endlessly happy. But misfortune loomed close by. Slava started suffering from severe headaches. He attributed it all to fatigue, to stress. Then he went for an examination. The results were a shock to us. Slava had an inoperable brain tumor. Doctor, tell me, how long do I have? Asked Slava, his face drained of color. The verdict was grim. It's hard to say for sure. From a month to six months, we need to observe how quickly it will grow. The tumor didn't grow too fast, but it was growing. I didn't know what to do, which gods to pray to to make the damned tumor disappear. Slava reassured me, saying that we were together, and that was the main thing. I was willing to sell my soul to the devil, if only Slava would recover. I dragged him to shamans and herbalists, believing in miracles. But no spells or potions could stop the cursed tumor's growth. And then one day we went to see an old grandmother, a powerful witch. We traveled 300 kilometers from home to a remote village where she lived. The grandmother looked at Slava and mumbled with her toothless mouth. I can't help you and nobody else can, I assure you. I burst into tears. Is there really nothing that can be done? The witch squinted at me. What are you willing to do to keep him alive? And what are you willing to do? Slava and I exchanged glances, and I silently mouthed, I'll die without you. He understood, he said, for anything. The grandmother spoke. My great-grandfather lived to be 100 years old. He would have lived longer if he hadn't been killed. Yet he was supposed to die very young. He was very ill. I don't remember my great-grandfather, but my mother told me that he was a werewolf. We exchanged glances again. Was the old woman delusional? She noticed, chuckled hoarsely. Yes, yes. I'm in my right mind. He became a werewolf and healed from his illness. He seemed rejuvenated. My mother said that at 90 he looked 60, that he could run faster than a horse. He was enduring and strong. And why was he killed? That's exactly why. Because of his lycanthropy. My mother said that during the full moon. Great-grandfather became someone else entirely, and he would leave the house. Where to, no one knew, and strange things happened in the village. They feared my great-grandfather, but enough about that. You'll find out for yourselves, if you dare. And how does one become a werewolf? I asked. The grandmother replied, that I don't know. But I know for sure that somewhere in the deep forest, there is a village of werewolves. It was there that my great-grandfather went and became a werewolf. He returned from there already, a werewolf. Does that mean he turned into a wolf or a bear, for example, during the full moon? I asked. The grandmother laughed. You've read silly books, watched television, and you believe in all sorts of fairy tales. He didn't turn into anything. He looked like an ordinary person, but inside, a beast. The beast slumbers until the time comes, and then it awakens. Grandmother, how do we find that village? That, I do not know. Search, and you will find. I see that you will find it. 
Just don't regret it. Later. We left the witch in confusion. Is she lying or not? Maybe she's truly insane. And anyway, what werewolves? What nonsense is all this? But, I'll repeat, I was ready to believe in any nonsense as long as Slava lived, and I began to scour the internet for information. I typed in various queries. Werewolves, about werewolves, about werewolves, lycanthropy, how to become a werewolf. All sorts of nonsense came up to become a werewolf on the night from Wednesday to Thursday during the full moon. Go into the forest. In the forest, find a fallen tree, strip naked, put on a necklace made of wolf teeth and claws around your neck and throw a skin over your body. Then jump over the fallen tree 100 times, or this. Whoever becomes a werewolf will be covered in fur from head to toe completely losing their human form. They will thirst for blood and seek it out. A person bitten by a werewolf will either die before the next full moon or turn into a werewolf themselves. And here's another one. He became a werewolf by going to the seventh generation witch. She performed a ritual allowing him to drink her blood Seven moons passed, and he became a werewolf. And so on and so forth. I was starting to think that the old woman had lied to me. The internet yielded nothing coherent upon the query of Werewolf Village. Yet, one day, I stumbled upon a forum delving into witchcraft, ancient rituals, and mystical tales, including lycanthropy. Forum exuded an air of trustworthiness, diverging greatly from what I had encountered before. Intrigued, I registered and delved into the discussions within the werewolf's thread, posing a question. Has anyone heard of a werewolf village? Amidst a sea of frivolous responses, one stood out. Let's take this to private messages. A user named Werewolf inquired, Why do you need to know? I replied, It's a matter of life and death. Werewolf responded, You need the dark net. You'll find what you seek there. I asked, What is the dark net? The reply came with smirk. Google it. As it turned out, the dark net was the Internet's underbelly, a realm not easily accessed. Rife with criminal activity, it was a haven for hackers and illicit traders, offering anything one desired. It took considerable effort to find someone who could guide me there. In the dark net, I found the one who pointed me towards the path of life. A message arrived in my inbox. I opened it. It was from Wolfbane. I know where to find what you seek. Take these coordinates. My heart raced. Wolfbane provided me with the coordinates to the werewolf village. I informed Slava about it. He was skeptical, but I persuaded him. Let's think of it as the vacation we've always dreamed of. He smiled sadly. That's not the kind of vacation we dreamed of. I retorted. Slava. We don't have any other options. And Slava agreed. Navigating to the werewolf village required traversing rough terrain. We sold our small car, took out a loan, and bought an off-road vehicle, gathering all necessities. We set off on our journey. We had to cover one and a half thousand kilometers. The road was long and arduous, shortly before reaching our destination. Our GPs failed. We passed through some abandoned settlement. The GPs indicated a right turn, then another right, and another. 
and suddenly we found ourselves back at the same abandoned settlement. We realized we were going in circles, so we consulted the map. We drove almost blindly, 50 kilometers away from our destination. The road ended. Before us lay an impenetrable forest. Let's go on foot, decided Slava. We abandoned the car and set out, resorting to old-fashioned navigation by compass and map. In this wilderness, smartphones were useless. Fear didn't grip us. I knew Slava was doomed regardless, and even if we were to perish here, at least we'd do so together. We walked for a long time, over a day. We had to camp in the forest, and finally, we seem to have arrived. The werewolf village should be somewhere here, but it was nowhere to be found. Maybe it doesn't even exist. Let's go back, said Slava. But I insisted, I insisted. It must exist. I can feel it. We'll find it soon. Let's go just a little further. And suddenly, Slava froze, he whispered. Don't move. He pulled out the pistol I had bought illegally. Through the dark net and from an acquaintance hacker, I followed his gaze. A massive, peculiar wolf peered out from the thicket, staring at us. Slava raised his gun, aiming at the wolf. It almost nodded then turned and vanished into the woods. Out of fear, we stood still for about 15 minutes. Then we breathed out. It seemed the wolf had fled. And then a young, sturdy man emerged onto the clearing. He asked, What are you doing here? I replied, We're looking for the werewolf village. Why? he inquired. I explained. The man said, I'm Andre. Follow me. I'll take you there. I gazed into his eyes and shuddered. The look mirrored that of the wolf who had frightened us. I blinked, but the illusion persisted. Their hue was strange, with a honeyed iris tinged with yellow, and I wasn't mistaken. Andre's eyes truly resembled those of a wolf. We had found what we were seeking. In the village dwelled both ordinary people and werewolves. Andre explained, Our settlement has existed for over 500 years. Finding us is difficult. Few people ever make it here. Almost no one knows about us because those who become werewolves usually stay here forever. Rarely does anyone return home. There have been only a few instances, one, two hundred years ago, and the other, and the other, and the other, not so long ago. Maybe it was him who told you about us? I asked. Why don't they return? Andre replied, Firstly, it's difficult for a werewolf to live among people. And secondly, after adapting, Few want to leave. They become part of the clan. Andre dispelled all the myths I had gleaned from the internet. He explained that one becomes a werewolf in two ways. Werewolfism is either passed down by blood, but not to everyone, and only if your ancestor was a true werewolf. I, for example, am a blood werewolf, but my brother and sister are ordinary. It wasn't passed to them. It doesn't always happen, or it's done through a ritual. At the wolf stump, Slava interrupted. Anne, remember reading about that? Like, stick a knife into the stump. Jump over it. He didn't finish because Andre laughed loudly. Nonsense. Wolf stumps exist only where werewolf clans live and there are few such places on Earth. I'll show you the wolf stump, and if you decide, he glanced at Slava with his beastly eyes, we'll turn you. 
not far from the village, in a large clearing, stood a massive stump covered in tufts of fur. As we approached, a wolf rubbed against it, leaving its fur behind. Andre clicked his tongue at it, and the beast ran off. Well ready, Andre asked Slava. Tonight happens to be the full moon. Slava nodded. We've got nothing to lose. That same night, Slava underwent the ritual with Andre. I won't describe it. I've been forbidden. After the ritual, Slava seemed unchanged, but sometimes I felt that he was no longer quite my husband. He became aggressive. He hit me, broke my nose, and at the sight of blood, he completely lost control. I thought he might kill me. Andre stopped him. This is what I was talking about. There needs to be an adaptation period to learn to control the beastly essence. It's lengthy. Within a month, a werewolf learns to recognize blood relatives and the spouse because they are energetically connected to them. If they love, of course. And within six months, they learn control over other people. We lived in the werewolf village for a month but we couldn't stay any longer. We needed to return. I couldn't stay in the werewolf village, and Slava didn't want to live there without me. Andre bid us farewell, sadly. You shouldn't have done this. Adaptation isn't complete. We made it home, went to the doctor. He was shocked. This is, of course, a miracle. But you are absolutely healthy, he told Slava. And I didn't doubt it, even without the X-ray, after everything I had seen in the village. I thought we would go back to living as we had before. But it didn't work out. On the surface, we're an ordinary family. But every full moon, Slava disappears for the entire night. He returns by morning. I've found blood on his clothes more than once. I don't ask about it. I just pray for him to be careful. Has he become a werewolf or a murderer? Whose blood is it? And how long will this continue? Yes, he's alive and he's with me. But has it made things easier for me? The night encounter with a werewolf this tale was shared by my grandfather, a fervent hunter who feared no one and ventured alone into the depths of the taiga in pursuit of bears. But on that particular occasion, his wife was reluctant to let him go. She insisted that, according to ancient belief, venturing into the woods on that day was ill-advised. It was the night of the full moon, and in such a night, one might encounter a werewolf. Grandpa scoffed at such superstitions and set out for his hunt, much to his wife's dismay. As he departed, she shouted after him, wishing for him to see for himself that she was right, and that on the night of the full moon, the power of the werewolf was at its peak. Grandpa ventured into the forest, found his spot, and waited for nightfall gauging the time by the stars before hunkering down in his hiding spot. As the clock struck midnight, the bushes rustled. He raised his rifle, ready to shoot. The sound of heavy footsteps approached, yet there was no sign of any creature. The steps drew closer, but Grandpa found himself unable to pull the trigger. Then an eerie laughter echoed through the woods, followed by a voice can't bring yourself to shoot. You won't be able to kill me. And once again, wild laughter filled the air. Terrified, Grandpa dropped his rifle. But soon, the rustling in the bushes ceased, and he realized that whatever mysterious creature it was, it had retreated. Grandpa, shaken to his core, dashed home constantly glancing over his shoulder, fearing the werewolf might be on his trail. 
Although he had heard many tales of terrifying werewolves before, this was his first actual encounter. He didn't dare tell his wife anything, instead opting to sleep in the attic that night. Come morning, he pretended to have just returned from his hunt. Grandpa also recounted that during that winter, there were reports of livestock disappearing not only from local farms, but also from the homestead. All the hunters in the area gathered, keeping vigilant watch. Eventually, they tracked down a massive wolf, unlike any they had ever seen before. Grandpa couldn't help but wonder. Could it have been his nocturnal acquaintance? He was a werewolf, yearning to become human. This story was sent in by a young woman named Natalia. I will continue to tell it on her behalf. I surrendered my heart to him, unaware of his lycanthropic nature, while in return I accepted the heart of a beast. Yet, even upon uncovering the truth, I continued to love him and believe in a brighter future. I ran with all my might. But the beast was upon me. I could hear him somewhere beside me. A sudden realization struck like lightning. He aims to cut off the path to the guardhouse. My breath caught. A fleeting thought raced through my mind. Just don't trip. The porch was now within reach. And then, the nocturnal silence was shattered by a gunshot. In the dark doorway stood the local ranger, Mikalaiki. Startled, I stumbled and fell. I glanced back. The beast leapt high, landed, and vanished, dissolving into the darkness. I don't recall how I found myself back home. The ranger plied me with strong spirits, insisting, You need to leave, daughter. Unable to sleep after the ordeal, I lay with closed eyes, reminiscing. My, my acquaintance with Kirill began at university. Walking down the corridor, a young man stood by one of the classroom doors, casting anxious glances as though lost. I inquired, and he smiled, tilting his head coyly. I fell for him instantly. We began to see each other. Sometimes Kirill would call in the dead night. I miss you terribly. Look out your window. I'd open the shutters, and a bouquet of wildflowers would come flying in. After our studies, we had a modest wedding. As he slipped the ring onto my finger, Kirill playfully remarked, I give you my heart. My parents, friends, and classmates attended the ceremony. Curiously, absent was anyone from Kirill's side, save for his schoolmate, who eyed him oddly and soon departed the festivities. We rented a one-bedroom apartment and crafted a happy familial nest. The first peculiar incident occurred three weeks after our wedding. By then, my husband had found decent employment, though frequent business trips were required. One evening, he returned late, visibly agitated, nervously peering out the window as though expecting someone. Brushing off my inquiries, he hastily dressed and bolted out without a word. I spent the entire night waiting trying to call him, but his mobile phone only chimed from the bedside table. A troubled sleep seized me at dawn. In my dreams, Kirill was running somewhere, fending off somewhere, fending off someone. I woke to the sensation of being petted on the head. Before me sat my husband. His shirt was dirty, pine needles and dry leaves clung to his hair. His cheek was scratched. He spoke of meeting old friends, a visit to a bar, excessive drinking. On their way home through the park, he felt unwell, and he remembered nothing more. For the New Year holidays, my parents invited us. 
I had prepared tickets and bought gifts in advance. When suddenly, Kirill announced he was leaving for another business trip. What business trip? No one works during the holidays. My spouse remained sullenly silent. What's going on, Care? Do you have someone else? Are you leaving for her? Have you lost your mind? What nonsense are you spewing? Why don't you trust me? In a rage, he pounded his fist against the wall. Breaking through the plaster, I cowered in fear on the couch. Kirill rushed to me, clutching my knees. Forgive me, my love. Forgive me. I truly can't stay. I went to my parents alone. After that, things were fine for a while, and I began to think about having a child, even planning to discuss it with my husband. But I never got the chance. One day, my former classmate invited us and some friends to spend the weekend at his grandfather's in a remote forest outpost. The ranger welcomed us warmly. However, his dog, bristling and growling, retreated into its kennel and eventually escaped. We unpacked, took a stroll through the woods, sat by the campfire. The next day, the boys went hunting while the girls went mushroom picking. They returned in the evening, gloomy and exhausted, all except Kirill. He was missing. No one noticed when he disappeared. We searched for him tirelessly, calling out, but to no avail. The search continued the next day, involving rescuers and the police, all in vain, fidgeting uncomfortably. Our friends bid their farewells. I understood. They had work, families to attend to. While I remained awaiting my husband, in the dead of night, a thought struck me. What if he got lost, found his way to the road, made it back home, barely able to wait until morning? My hands trembled. The key wouldn't fit into the lock. No one. Since then, I frequented the ranger's cabin. I brought gifts, each time asking, hopefully, Mikhailich, has anyone seen him? What do the locals say? Oh, different things. Better for you, daughter, not to know. The ranger avoided my gaze. I decided to visit my mother-in-law to share the tragedy. A nut, so old woman. She listened, never lifting her gaze from the wooden floorboards, and then began speaking softly. Forgive me, Natasha, for Kiryusha didn't tell you when he decided to marry. And he forbade me. He's a werewolf. He loved you deeply and believed he could overcome it. And she proceeded to recount how their neighbor and Kirill's classmate Ivan invited him to spend the last vacation before graduation at his grandmother's house in a Belarusian village surrounded by forests where battles with the fascists took place during the Great Patriotic War. The boys spent their days exploring the woods, engrossed in excavating wartime relics. One night while far from the village, they got lost and wandered through the thickets for hours. But just as they were nearing a familiar road, disaster struck. On a hillock against the backdrop of a huge full moon, the silhouette of a large beast suddenly appeared, emitting a guttural roar. The creature lunged towards them. Ivan managed to reach the bunker they had recently inspected and squeezed into the crevice. But Kirill wasn't as lucky. Ivan heard only his friend scream. But when silence fell, and Ivan emerged from his hiding place, Kirill's body was nowhere to be found. The entire village was in an uproar the next day, searching for the boy for two days straight, and on the third day, he returned on his own. He didn't say where he'd been, insisted he couldn't remember, covered in wolf fur, blood in places, yet uninjured. This is what Ivan told me. Since then, during the full moon, my son would disappear 
and remnants of wildlife would be found in the vicinity, along with tufts of fur. I couldn't disbelieve my mother-in-law, but this was like something out of the Middle Ages. I needed to meet him, confirm if he was a werewolf. I just had to venture out at night without gamekeeper hearing. And so I went to the ranger's cabin again. The moon bathed the vast field in pale light, freshly mown by the homestead, with wooden feeders lined along the edges. I walked towards it, towards the boundary of light and the dark swath of forest. Past the fence, a chilling howl sounded nearby, and suddenly two red eyes of fire came hurtling towards me. I remember nothing more. Two years have passed. I'm still waiting for Kirill. He's a werewolf, but I love him. A phrase I read in an ancient treatise gives me hope. After several years, reversible, where wolves may return to their human form, 